see. Do we have anybody who wants to volunteer to take notes? Everybody looks down. Uh, I see you all over there. <laughs> We will need a note taker and to try to get this going relatively quickly. We have a pretty full meeting, so session. Can you just request that the chess table in that corner and all the other tables in this Yeah, I, I was I've been surprised by that, yes. <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, it is 9.30, so let's get started, and hopefully somebody will volunteer to take notes when I get to that slide. So, Bernard, can you hear audio good? Let me take my mask off so I can be a little more less muffled. Yeah, uh, we're good. Good, good. Um, all right, so welcome to ABT Core, ITF-118. Uh, meeting tips. Um, if you're in the room, please sign into uh, either the light client or the full client. Um, if you sign into the full client, please turn off your um, audio and video. Um, also, audio playback if you're in the room. Otherwise, we'll get echo, which is un unfortunate. Uh, remote participants, um, please make sure your audio and video off unless you're speaking. Um, and use of a headset is recommended. Uh, remote meeting tips. I think the UI has changed slightly, but these are still roughly accurate. Uh, raise your hand to join the queue if you want to speak. Um, you will need to enable your audio um, manually. Uh, you can also enable your video, but that's separate from audio. Um, video is encouraged, but not required. Uh, here are some links if you have the PDF. If you don't have the PDF, whatever. Um, agenda and notes. We still need a a note taker before we can get started. So would somebody please volunteer to take notes? Ideally somebody who's not presenting. Oh, Mo, uh, Mo, Mo volunteers. Thank you, Mo. All right, note well, uh, we are in the IETF. Um, we have various processes and policies about IPR, about uh, use of your personal information, about code of conduct. Please be aware of these and follow these. Uh, especially, oops. I, do you want to do that really well? Okay, yeah. So particularly there is a code of conduct, so please behave uh, professionally and uh, appropriately with everybody here. Um, if you feel that someone has behaved inappropriately, you can talk to the ombuds team or any of the leadership. Here's the agenda. It's a pretty full agenda, so we'll try to stay on time. I know we're not usually good at staying on time, but we'll try. Um, and uh, so, but let's get through the preliminaries first. Yeah, my suggestion is that we actually use the timer tool for this meeting because that's, that's I think a good we're going to be extremely, extremely tight. Yeah. Um, do you want to run the timer? Or do you want me to run the timer? How about if you run it? Okay, sounds good. Okay, so draft status, various things published. Um, uh, VP9. Is it still in MISREF on? What's the MISREF? Uh, MISREF is um, LRR, which is the MISREF on frame marking. So. Okay. Um, uh, Skip is in AD follow up. We'll be discussing that a bit today. Uh, frame marking. Um, I think Mo didn't realize there was one more ID, revised ID needed, which I think is just the boilerplate. Yeah, the BCP fourteen stuff yeah. is wrong. Yeah, I think what I think actually the draft is older than the current boilerplate, which is what happened. That's fine. It's just I, it, I, I would rather we fix it than the editor than make the editor fix a BCP problem. Okay, fair. So okay, Mo, Mo nods, so good. Um, and ABC, EVC is in IETF last call, which I think just started yesterday. yesterday. Good. Okay, we did a uh, a um, uh, WG's last LC on B3C. And we've adopted a number of drafts, which we will, I think, be talking about all of these today or most of these. Most of these, at least. All right. Um, okay, we have some errata. Um, do we want to pull up what these actually are? or? Yeah, probably. 
Um, let me see if, well, I can't, I can't do that from here because it's a PDF. Right. But, um, how do you want to do this? Let's see. Um, sorry, say, say good, Murray. I can do these now for you if you want, if you go through them. Yeah, we just need to look, pull up what they are. So let's see. Um, let's see. I can just Google it, I guess. I could probably do a screen share from That's the probably slide. the easiest thing, yeah. That might, that might do it. Hold on. Let me yeah. let me pull that up that way. Uh, hold on. Um, all right. Oh, let me uh, let me do it. Uh, all right. I will screen share. Oh, all the slot for the requested media are already taken. <laughs> oh, I think you have to unshare unshare the slides before you can share the. Okay, I will unshare the slides, and then I will share the screen, hmm. and uh, I will attempt to share. Yeah, here we go. All right. So here's uh, here's Francesca's stuff. Hmm. I then double click on uh, this and stick it in here. Maybe that will do it. Okay. Uh, no, we're still seeing the slides. I've only shared the tab. Oh, no, here we are. Here we are. Good. Okay. Maybe, maybe make it a little bigger. Uh, can I make it a little bigger? Um, hmm. <laughs> maybe make, make the window smaller. <laughs> okay. Make the window. Yeah. Uh, no, actually, I can see it. I think I can see it here. I just can't see it on my screen. Okay. All right. Okay. okay. So. Uh, Yeah, that, that one's pretty. That, that one's pretty clear. Yes, definitely. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, so that's so basically for uh, hold on. for this one, we for EID forty eight seven three. The notes should reflect that we agree with Francesca. It should be verified. Yep, it's verified. And, no, no, okay, Murray so, does it. Murray is doing it live. Ah, very cool. Uh, okay, and then uh, we will. This is EID forty-nine thirty-eight. Okay, we're still seeing a slide at the moment. Do you have to switch? Or are we still see the the slide, not the mail message? Oh, it's not coming up. Yeah. Oh, weird. Uh, it hasn't. Oh, because it came up in the other one. Hold on. Uh, if I do this, it should come back. Okay, hold on. Now it should show up. Now you see it, right? Yes. Okay. 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 Oh, this is actually cryptography, so we have to pay attention to this. <laughs> All right. Um... Oh, right. I remember this. We discussed this uh, a long time ago. And I think um, this was actually a interop bug we found between two implementations. Right. And I believe the errata is how everybody then implemented it. So probably this should be approved. Um, but I'd like to make sure that people, so, you know. Yeah. So more hold on. Mind. Let's take a look at. Uh, I want to make sure the work working group signs off on this change. Was this always the intent? Uh, should be hold, should it be hold for document update? It's not completely clear. Hmm. I think it's pretty clear. I think it's pretty clear. Um, right there, Murray. I, I would say verify it if the working group originally meant to say what's there, even if it was wrong. Mm -hmm. And then uh, hold for document update if if it. If in, in the other case, mm -hmm. yeah, no, I just I'm trying to remember. Can you oh, go back okay. to the mail up? Uh, there we are. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I personally I'm comfortable with either status here, given what given what the what the request is. It's not clear to me which one it should be, and both of them have basically the same effect. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it's. 
I mean, this was the working group consensus on how to do it, but I don't know if that was actually the original intent or it was actually ambiguous in the original. And then, because I think I wasn't, I'm not sure it was well described in the, I mean, I think we, I think it wasn't thought about clearly when we wrote the draft. So then I would say hold. Okay. All right. When AD and former AD in the room, they can argue with me if they want. <laughs> Both for document update. Okay. Okay. And then the last one. Uh, 6752. So let's look at that one. What? Because. Because it actually is affecting your ability and it actually will get into the future in the future. It will take the right thing. If, if the working group got it wrong, but that was the consensus of what to say, then verified is the right thing. If the working group got it right, like this reflects consensus, even if consensus was a bad idea, yeah. then it's hold. Yeah. I'm not sure consensus was ever, I think it was not thought about clearly. Yes. So, <laughs> okay, it, it, fine. <laughs> yeah. All right, what is this? This is just uh, somebody got, um, somebody said frame when they met field um because people aren't thinking about interleave early video um i what's the number right again? which one is this again uh this is uh, uh yeah i guess 6752 rt payload format for yep got it yeah um yeah i, I believe this is yeah the intent the intent always was that interleave is supported and so we should say people are we're being sloppy about field versus frame but verified. they met field yeah verified. i think this one is should be verified verified yeah right we're done okay great thank you yeah okay back to the slides. great so basically we agree with francesca yeah all right um so uh actually let me go back to the the slides proper yes. the pdf and we will uh hold on uh, go back there and share the preloaded slides, blah, 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 confirm the selection, and then go to slide. Uh, okay. Yeah. So now back to the old registry uh, question. Um, and I don't know if Harold is in the room. Um, because I know Magnus yeah, is in yeah. the room, which is Harold, good. Harold is over there, yeah. Okay, excellent. So uh, basically, this is the issue with the RTP payload type registry, which is missing a bunch of video codecs, maybe other stuff. Uh, the MIME type registry is more complete. And I guess Harold is tracking this in the Media Man working group. So we want to get a rough sense of what to do. And so just so People remember this is covered in RFC 8088, section, section 74, where it says it shall be requested the media type is included. <clears throat> but the shall was not for IANA, it was for the authors. <laughs> and uh, so it didn't happen automatically and uh, the documents didn't include this. And so that's how we ended up where we are. So um, we had some posts from the mailing list. Stefan uh, made a recommendation that we revise 8088 section 74. And then Magnus um, suggested that we close the RTP registry and update 4855 and RFC 8088. Um, and then in the process, clean up the registry, which I think we discussed doing anyway. Um, and uh, with, with the missing formats, at least the video ones. <clears throat> And then the question is who depends on the registry? And I guess that's uh, the original reference that caused all this whole uh, stuff was in WebRTC PC. I guess that could be, that reference could be changed to refer to the media type registry. Um, Harold, do you have a comment on, on Magnus's recommendation here? I know you're tracking this in Media Man. So I'm afraid that we, hello, Overstrom speaking. I'm afraid that we actually forgot to put it on the agenda at, meet, at the Media Man meeting. So the Media Man group doesn't have an opinion yet. 
Uh, well, how about personally, you? <laughs> personally, I think that uh, closing the registry is reasonable. Somewhere we ought to preserve the information that this uh, media type is uh, useful for RTP or not. But uh, having two registries was obviously a dumb idea. Magnus Westland. So, I mean, this information is actually captured in each registration that supports RTP usage. Uh, so, there are information in the registry entries for the media types registry for which supports RTP. Uh, at least for all of the after 3000 or so, the first, to so say, 1890. 18, Payload formats that's in the original profile might be not have that information. We didn't fix that in the in 1890 bis. Don't, don't remember. Need to check. Okay. Um, can you take a working item to check this? And I presume we just need a short a short uh, document to say close the the registry. Can you? Can I ask you to take that, Magnus? <laughs> Since you since you made the Opern suggestion, that's yeah. your punishment. Is to... <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, Mag Magnus is going to um, take t write a short document closing this registry. Okay. And uh, just to check with Harold, uh, it, assuming we do this, I guess we can move the Weber to CPC reference to the to the media types registry, and that will not cause a problem. He, uh, he's nodding, but also working. With him. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, uh, so I think we're we're making progress on that. Okay. Um, I don't have to talk about the response from Iana, but basically the Iana folks are basically saying, "Hey, we don't read your mind, and whatever yeah. you do, be be very clear and make sure you understand what triggers what." Um, so you can read Amanda's uh, advice there, which obviously yeah. we hadn't taken before. Yeah. Okay, so now uh, we're at the JPEG 2000 RTP okay. payload format. Okay. Uh, is uh, do we have a presenter? Do we have a presenter? Uh, we can come back to it, I guess. We could, yes. So maybe that's the oh, can you hear me now? Yes, we, we can. can hear you. Cool. All right, okay. Thanks. We can set the, uh, set the timer for 10 minutes. Yeah, where is, where is the timer control now? I actually can't find it. It's oh, here in, it is. It's under, it's under the tools. Yes. Yeah. All right. Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. So, this um, was a um, proposed payload format uh, that improves on uh, the existing JPEG 2000 RTP payload format that was presented at the last working group meeting. So, next slide. There's a subsequent call for adoption that completed uh, successfully yesterday. And um, uh, there's a new internet draft that's expected shortly to address two issues that were identified during the last WG call. And um, I've actually set up a GitHub repo with two pull requests that uh, address those two issues. So I'm, and I'm gonna go in a little bit more detail with the second one. Uh, the first one is pretty trivial. It's just updating the figures to kind of be more consistent with um, other RTP payload formats. Um, and uh, but last and but not least, uh, also there was a demonstration of an M FPGA implementation that uses the RTP payload format just recently at um, at an industry event. Um, and uh, packet captures are available if folks want to play with it. All right. So next up, so uh, one of the issues that was um, raised at the last working group meeting, and I had the chance to dig a little bit more deeper into it. So. The proposed payload format has a field, um, header field, that contains um, a uh, timestamp on every single packet in the same time base as the, you know, as the standard timestamp in the RTP header. Mm -hmm. And uh, the goal of this uh, field is to provide a much higher, a much uh, higher granularity clock to um, facilitate or to improve clock recovery by the receiver. And uh, it was pointed out uh, during the last working group meeting that there's, there's an RFC, RFC 5450, that um, also discusses um, a, an offset, um, uh, you know, a timestamp for every single packet. And so, um, but it looks to me like um, 
both PT stamp in this proposed payload format and RFC 5450 address kind of really different issues. So 5450 is a very generic uh, mechanism um, to provide offset, um, a temporal offset when the transmission time of a packet is significantly different from the presentation time of its payload. And that's really typically in the case, for instance, of uh, uh, inter-frame uh, inter codex. So when there's frame reordering or when you do retransmission or large variation in video frame sizes. And as a result, because it's a kind of a generic mechanism, that's a pretty big payload at that timestamp. Whereas PT stamp is a much narrower use case, which is really to just improve clock recovery by providing additional clock samples. And it's a, it's a much smaller field and it's much more hardware friendly. Um, so anyway, so I think um, after um, doing this research, and so I'm, I'm, my my proposal is to add informative text to the to the J, to this uh, J2K uh, SCL payload format to you know kind of indicate that 5450 exists for those folks that do want to um, handle you know large differences between transmission time, nominal transmission time and actual transmission time, but and separately there's PT stem for improved clock uh, recovery. Anyway, so the, I don't want to go over time. This is all in the GitHub. So for folks that want to comment, please use the reflector or go directly on the GitHub and uh, provide your feedback. Thank you. OK, great. Yes, and, and uh, uh, please submit your document with a new working group name. Exactly, that's right. So I, I plan, you know, unless I hear otherwise, maybe at the end of next week, I'll issue a new ID with, the, uh, with uh, resolving those two issues and uh, with the new name. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Okay, we're now gonna talk about the RTP payload format for skip and we can reset the timer to uh, 10 minutes. Yep. Dan or Mike? Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, we pr published draft version six uh, just before the last uh, interim meeting on September 19th, updated the abstract, added a key point section up front, included a link to the public, old public version of SCIP 210. Um, you know, we were reluctant to give that out before, but sort of bit the bullet to provide that link to, because the reviewers kept asking for it and we kind of capitulated to, to let them have it. So it's, it's now in the document. Um, we also added some STP examples for prioritized codex in there. Um, fortunately, we received no comments back from the, from the ICSG regarding version six. Um, what we're doing now for version seven is again, we're providing additional text to updates to the abstract. We'll probably get rid of the key point sections we added before, since now most information is in the abstract. And again, waiting for additional feedback from the skip, skip working group as well as others in the ABT core group. Uh, before uh, we publish. And then basically next slide. Um, again, at the skip working group meeting we had in a couple weeks ago in Warsaw, um, management expressed concern about why this effort's really been kind of stalled for the last, so it's basically since January, not much has really happened with the ICSG at this point. So we're kind of trying to figure out <laughs> Hopefully we can get whatever last updates we have with version seven to make everybody happy to, to move things forward because people are trying to, both the US government and NATO are kind of need this document to proceed in order for the next generation of skip products that are being proposed. So it's kind of basically where we are at this point. Um, so I wanted to just go over where I, where I think what I think we can do to make 07 hopefully the last draft here because uh, I think 07 is a lot better in that it it kind of addresses some of the fundamental misconceptions um, in some ways adding uh, the publicly available skip to 10 it's a mixed bag because it'll it will let people know yes it's publicly available but then they could think that that's somehow important which it is not um, so that's the downside of it but I think um, we have tried to make it clear why you shouldn't be parsing skip. But I think there are a few little things more that we need to do 
Um, for example, in section five, which is RTP payload, need a little more detail on the RTP packetization, depacketization. I think we've made it roughly clear what happens, which is that skip handles the MTU, so just provides uh, stuff in the appropriate bite-sized pieces, so you don't, packetizer actually doesn't have to packetize, really. Uh, but we just need to state that, I think, explicitly and, and explain the figure a little bit. I do think we need a little bit of, uh, an, there's been a, whole, there's a bunch of discusses relating to profiles. So I think we need a little bit more on transport, um, which is the interaction of, S, of skip with multiplexing. Um, my understanding is skip is orthogonal to RTP, RTCP multiplexing, like you could multiplex it uh, the RTP and RTCP or not, or you could do symmetric RTP or not, but it's it's kind of irrelevant. Is that right? Um, so yeah, yeah, know. yeah. It doesn't. I mean, it's just the payload that's being encrypted. It's not the right, right. Everything so, else, so anyway, things like that are useful to just, even though they're obvious to you, it, it may be useful to say them, mm -hmm. because then um, the other question is, could you do bundle, like bundle audio and video? Is that something that could ever make sense in Skip? It would change the SDP. I uh, wouldn't change much, but um, is, that, is that that's right, also. Well, I, uh, I mean, my understanding. Again, I've, I've read that briefly a few months ago in some of the comments. I'm not completely understand how it works, but I think that should be completely separate from SCIP if you want to do it or not do it. Right. right. I so, don't think it anyway, should matter. You know. Right. Just just sometimes just saying those things just explicitly may may help uh, clear up some confusion. And then there was a bunch of ISG comments about profiles and feedback. So let me kind of describe what I think might clear up the confusion there, um, which is basically that SKIP provides security services, confidentiality, replay, and integrity protection for the RTP payloads. Um, does SKIP provide any security services for RTCP? No. No, right, that's what I thought. No. Yeah, so it might be useful to say that explicitly um, and then, you know, the question is, uh, the additional security by SRTP, you know, does that have any value? So you, you've already, you've got all these services for the payload. Um, should, should anybody care about using SRTP? Is that, are there attacks that, you know, as an example, um, you get the authentication services if you use SRTP. Uh, and then you could use Cryptex or something to do the RTP uh, header extensions and CSRCs. That would prevent some attacks, like trying to figure out who is the dominant speaker or something like that. Is that a? Uh, is there any value to SRTP there? Um, um, again, I think it's kind of sort of separate from Skip. I think if you wanted to do it or not do yeah. it. Yeah. So anyway, it would just be some text deal. saying, some text saying yes, you can use SAV. AVP and here's why it might be good, or you could just use AVP if you didn't if you didn't care about this stuff. So, um, and then the other thing is relating to the feedback, which is whether you need the SAVPF, um, you know, skip handles retransmission. So if all you need is NAC or RTX, then I think it's, irre you know, you, you could dispense with feedback. But then the question is what about other stuff? Like if you're doing skip video, would you care about PLI, FAR, or RPSI? So would you need the feedback? Is there an implementation? Is to, uh, do people dispense with feedback? I'm not quite um, sure what those, those PLI, FAR, but like, say, say we're doing skip in a video conference and you lost a picture. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the skip RTX, is it's trying to recover stuff, but for some reason it can't recover a packet in a in a frame what happens is it does the communication terminate or something no no you'll just I mean, for for audio typically you know if, if you lose a packet then you may yeah you for may audio you, you lose, just skip it for, for video you, know, you what, skip a packet for video at this point it's more like the same thing you'll just just you lose it and move on and get the next one so yeah but it won't be right. decodable would you but no i mean you'll you'll, you'll 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 lose crypto cryptographic synchronization for a brief amount of time before it can and be then what and then what happens um once it's reestablished, then you'll be able to get back into start decrypting all the packets again so yeah but i'm just 
can I'm but, just my but, question is yes you'll have you'll be able to decrypt but will you be able to decode I'm, I'm just wondering if but, there's an automatic keyframe generation in there somewhere that can, like like a, the equivalent can, of a can, can I interrupt for a minute can I interrupt yeah. for a minute mm -hmm. um, that is the device will handle what it needs to do uh, and if if they do need to do this th that can be covered elsewhere we you're, you're talking about how the application works and we're really uh in, in regard to rtp and we can't change the terminals that are out there they're going to be there so we can't mandate things and and discussions at this level might be just considered out of scope for the purpose of this rfc yeah well um, you've got to discuss that basically people want to know should you negotiate avpf that's the only question here Right. If it's if if the feedback isn't necessary, if it's analyzed, give I mean, the answers. You don't you don't need it, and we can you can yeah, just say that. Like, no, terminals aren't likely to implement it, so don't don't negotiate it. It sounds like so. Yeah, that's that's basically the question. Yeah. Anyway, um, so if that's the case, you can basically say forget about the the F, and and if you if you care about the S, you can do that. All right, and then the last is the security considerations, which is just. I think all you need to do is just state the security services you have and then just talk about some of the stuff we just said, you know, what you get if you get SRTP or not. Um, and then maybe a few things about RTCP, which is not protected. So anyway, that that's basically a summary of what I think you need to do to kind of address all the discusses. It's it shouldn't be a lot of work, maybe maybe an hour or so just writing this stuff down. I think you understand what all the answers are. Um, and then that'll that'll take care of all the discusses, if that makes sense. Uh, it, is it is it appropriate to use the words that that uh, I mean you you're bringing up things that we have have seen in comments, but were never considered as part of this. We consider them to be out of scope for what this document is trying to do. Yeah. Um, See what you what you're dealing with though is you've got an RTP payload document. The ISG is looking at RFC eighty eighty eight looking for the stuff that's supposed to be in that document. It isn't there. So that's why you've had these discusses and that's why these discusses will remain until you actually do. I mean, there's stuff like, I don't think any of the things we've just talked about are particularly important. They're just text in there that just checks the boxes for an RFC 88. Basically document. just make sure to mention, no, this is not important and this is why. Right. That's basically what we're saying is a whole bunch of things about why this doesn't matter or, you know, just but clarifying it so the box gets checked. Um, and will we be expecting to see more of these now, now that more people might be looking at 210? Well, that's that's um, I am a little bit apprehensive about this, but hopefully we put in enough language about why it's irrelevant that they'll they can look at it and go, oh, now I understand from the document why I shouldn't act on this. It's like, I yes, mean, I have this information, and no, you should not parse anything using that have, information. We have to have. Like, yeah. Yeah. We need we need to understand something though too about this. You know, some of these these concerns about vulnerabilities. These products are not normal. This is not an app you run on a PC. It's these devices have yeah. gone through their nation's security verifications to, to get to the level where they are. Um, so maybe that's not understood, that they're thinking that this is just something that, that, that you download and put on a PC and off you go. Um, you can do that, but you're, you're not going to be doing the things at the level mm -hmm. that what this is meant to do. Uh, we have a comment from the floor. Zahed? Hi, this is Jahed. Um... I'm one of the AD that has discusses on this and a lot of things that we're discussing here. Actually, that was the uh, reason for having the discussion to know like what are the things. So when we are basically looking at an um, uh, to be RFC or like a draft coming to us or at least to me is basically whether I understand what is written there. I understand there's a lot of thing that, well, this is already in the device and all these things, but this is not about what is already in the device. This is about the RTP payload format, as we understand. And I'm reading the draft saying like, hey, you have not been talking about this. And this is like some of the things you cannot really keep um, like unattended saying like I have, this is up to my interpretation because I was actually looking for whether 
I could understand like there is a VPF that's not maybe needed at all here, or uh, RTCP is not really the big big thing here. But as a RTP payload framework, um, documenting those things, why we, those parts that need not needed, and why, and make it clear for the leaders whoever implementing this one is really important. So okay. that's why that's what we are talking okay. about. Because this is so try to understand like this is about the clarity on the RFC that we're publishing also. Yeah. So as a as a question, if we do the things that we've suggested here, will that help you? That would help me, yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I don't think this is a lot of work. You know, it's just like spending an hour just writing this stuff down. I think we know what all the answers are, but just will help the clarity. So not a huge right. deal. Shouldn't be anyway. All right. All right. Thank you. Great. Bernard, you'll follow up with the authors to make sure that all gets done. Uh, yes. My, Great. I'm... Okay. All right. All right. Let's so now see. we're at uh, RTP over quick, and we should set the timer for 15 minutes. Oh, 15 minutes. Sorry. Athos or Spencer? What just happened? Um, yeah. For the notes in the last slide, the authors agreed to, uh, to add the security, the suggested security and profile uh, considerations. Yeah. And Bernard will work with them to make sure it gets done right. Okay. RTP over quick. All right. Uh, short update to RTP over quick. Next slide, please. Um, we updated or closed quite a lot of issues in the last or since, since the last interim meeting. I think the biggest changes we made is that we rearranged the congestion control section and made a lot of changes there. Uh, we added uh, IANA considerations. Um, I'm not really an expert on IANA considerations. So it would be nice if some people could review that. I think uh, Lucas had already taken a look, but it would be nice if more people could uh, look at that. And then we moved a lot of um, the parts that we had in the RTCP um, analyze a section to an appendix because there were normative references which we don't want to have in the document because they were referencing individual drafts and we moved a lot of that to the appendix so it's still in there as informative references but uh, we don't depend on that in this document and uh, we, we also have a list of which um, uh, potential extensions to quick we could use in the appendix um, so there are a lot more changes listed here and in the next slide too I think uh, you can skip to that yeah so um, if you're interested in the details, I won't go into that now, but uh, please have a look at the next, a new version of the draft. Um, yeah, okay, then next slide. Uh, we have closed a few issues as won't fix. Um, please reopen if you disagree with, with these, but for these four, we think for the first two that they are dependent on drafts that are individual drafts or may process further somewhere else. And if they become RFCs, then maybe we want to say something about this in RTP over quick, but we don't want to do this in this version of RTP over quick, but maybe in a follow-up document or later, because we don't want to depend on these now. And also for some of these, we think that there's actually not that much <clears throat> that we need to say about in our document, because uh, they are not specific to RTP over quick, but more for RTP in general or quick in general. Uh, and then the last two here, reset stream and the stop sending and close stream, that's what we discussed in the last interim meeting, um, that we added a section for um, the reset stream part that we discussed last time. Uh, and uh, yeah, then the, uh, I think the decision from the last interim meeting was that we don't need to do anything about stop sending and close stream. Um, next slide. There are two more issues that are currently labeled as uh, probably won't fix. Um, the first one is interaction with ICE. We kept this open because there is still work going on in the quick net traversal draft. And last time we had the peer-to-peer -peer quick draft here. Um, if there will be something to say about this in our document, then we can still do this at a later point, but we wanted to wait for what's going to happen with these drafts first. Um, I think that we probably also don't need to do say much. I do need to say much about this in our draft because it's um, not specific to RTP over quick. Uh, so once we have a, a connection using ICE or a quick nut traversal or something like that, then we can use RTP over quick on top of that. But um, I don't think there's much specific to what our draft needs to say about it. Uh, maybe some signaling, but our draft also doesn't handle signaling because we have moved that to another individual draft a long time ago. So 
uh, if we need to say something about signaling, then that can happen in the signaling draft. And uh, multipath, uh, there's still the issue with that. We added some um, considerations for multipath in the motivation already, but we don't have specific things to say about multipath uh, in um, our document except for the motivational part. Uh, and I think multipath uh, is going on or moving on in the quick working group. Uh, if there's anything to say about this in our document at a later point, um, then we can still add that, but I don't think again that we need to say much about it except for the motivation. Next slide. So then we have four issues which we would like to discuss or ask for review today. Um, these are these four. I will go into detail in the next slide. So next slide, please, for 84. Um, we want or would like to add some more detail about how to do congestion control when we are sharing one quick connection with RTP and some other non-RTP data streams. Um, we added the multiplexing part. Uh, I think last year we discussed that a lot, how to multiplex different um, data streams with RTP and RTCP. And one requirement was that we make this possible. Um, but we don't have a lot of detail about how to handle congestion control in this case. I think one thing we say in the document is that one option is, of course, to use different connections. Then you have different congestion controllers for both. Um, but it would, of course, be nice to have one connection. And since we have this multiplexing, but we didn't have a protocol that could actually be multiplexed with RTP on the same quick connection. We wrote these two toy uh, protocol drafts down there. The first one is just a simple mapping of data channels to quick. And the second one explains how this could be multiplexed with RTP over the same connection. Uh, I don't know if they are useful for anyone, but these describe how the multiplexing itself could work. But now we need to say, how can we do the congestion control to make sure that um, the data doesn't starve the media or vice versa. Um, and one way, of course, could be to artificially rate limit the non-real-time streams. So um, we still have a fixed ratio or something like that for the media stream. I think I have a few th more thoughts on this on the next slide. Um, yeah, so I mentioned the ratios. Uh, we could set fixed ratios for media and non-media. Uh, we could define some complex structure to explain uh, or to express some policies how this could be mapped. Um, one easy option would be to just leave the whole thing to the application, uh, but the application would probably need to uh, have a lot of information from the quick stack. Um, if it can have this information, for example, if it knows what uh, how much data is queued within the quick stack and how much congestion window or how large the congestion window is, then it uh, may figure out how much data or how much real time it can send at any moment. Um, if the application keeps the quick buffers low anyway, then this could be um, quite instant actions. Um, it would allow to adjust uh, at like the decision how much data or media to send at any point. Um, but it would probably become a new API question of what do we need to expose to the application so that the application can actually make this decision. Um, Spencer. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I just wanted to say that uh, I was able to attend about the first 20 minutes of CCR, uh, CCWG yesterday, and I'm thinking that uh, I, I'm thinking that uh, we really don't have a huge amount of guidance that we would be able to say on. Uh, you know, more than do the right thing uh, on this topic, uh, just just based on that, based on discussion uh, at, right at the beginning of uh, CCWG yesterday. So um, I just wanted to provide that as input. Thank you all. Great, thank you. Um, Q's empty, I guess. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, if you have any input on this, that would be great if you could let us know or put it in the issue here, the number is 84, um, please comment there. Um, then the next issue is, I think, also congestion control. Um, yeah, this is about um, real-time congestion controllers and quick stacks. Uh, we have some guidance in our document that says it would be nice if the quick, con uh, quick implementation could use a low latency congestion controller. Um, we have references to Scream, Nader, and GCC, and I know that Bernard already mentioned uh, there's COPA and Quick in 
uh, our GitHub issue, I think. I didn't add this to the slide because I only saw that later. Um, so I don't know much about the Copa implementation in Quick, but it would be nice to have some information in the draft, I think, about what would be required to have these low latency implementations in Quick, uh, and whether it makes sense to have the references to these algorithms in there. We know that there are timestamps required for some of them. And yeah, we wonder if, if there's anything else that our document needs to say about these algorithms and how usable they are in Quick. Um, and then there's also L4S, which is already mentioned in the draft, but it requires some more uh, cooperation from the network. Bernard? Yeah, um, both L4S and COPA have been implemented. L L4S is in the Apple Quick implementation, and I don't know how available that is. Like, um, but COPA is in the uh, Meta Move Fast implementation of Quick, and I believe that's also been used in some of the mock demos. Spencer may know more. Um, so anyway, both of those are available. I don't know that anybody's experimented with RTP over quick with any of those two things, uh, but we do have two low latency implementations available. I don't know. Uh, All right, so if anyone has experience with this, it would be nice if you could also comment on the issue or now so that we can add any um, information that is helpful to the draft. Uh, I don't see who's next on the oh, Randall. queue. Randall, we don't hear you. Muted, double okay. muted. Um, the current draft for, uh, this is Randall Jessup, Mozilla. Uh, the current draft for, for uh, um, web transport at the uh, uh, W3 side is that the, uh, you know, we can request a real time, uh, a real time congestion control, but we cannot uh, mandate it, um, you know, it's, it's merely a request and the implementation may do so or not. Um, so I think, it, you know, it, I think for this uh, draft, you have this, you should say that, you know, you should use a real time congestion control, but I don't think you should be saying much about what uh, congestion control should be used. Um, uh, you know, I, you know, you may perhaps give some, you can give examples, but I don't think that you can do much more than that. Yeah, that's what the draft currently does. It references these three and says it would be nice if the quick implementation, uh, or should, the, the quick implementation should use one of these or any other low latency uh, algorithm, but we don't require which one specifically. Um, yeah, but the question is just like, do we need to add more information about what the quick implementation or like, what of these algorithms are applicable in quick implementations? Because for these three, which we had before, I don't really know if there are any implementations in quick stacks and um, if that's easily doable. Uh, so who's next? Peter? Another thing that might be useful to say in, in response to Randall's comment is to say you should implement, say, one of these timestamp extensions. Because if you don't, then the remote side will be more limited in which algorithms it can implement. <clears throat> and I can also mention that I saw another implementation of COPA in a library for Quick called TQuick. So another data point, I guess. But I, I believe that COPA does not require the, the any timestamp extension. Peter, what was this TQuick? Is that a what language? In Rust. Oh, okay. It's on GitHub. All right, thanks. That's good to know. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I think. I mean, it's it's a good good that we're referencing all this all these three. We have been like, talking like GCC. I don't know like what is in the draft and what is in the implementation. So um, this is it. Like, I don't know. Uh, so. Um, the, 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 what what I actually came up to say is, um, well, we need some consideration on the like red adaptation part. Uh, I mean, we could also think like a quick will do condition control of this one, depending on whatever quick implements, because we don't expect with RTP this one, we don't expect like quick to change a lot. 
just to carry RKP, right? That's the spirit of this whole document. So, I mean, Quick can uh, do its own conditional control, build, build the back pressure, where we actually do pretty specific rate control depending like like the need we have. Um, and actually in RMCAT, we, we explored that part in this screen. Uh, so I, I know it works just so we, we might actually be in this job, focus more on the rate adaptation part, but not in the condition control and telling the quick stack should get some um, information back so that we can do the rate adaptation better, like even it's a back pressure or building up queue or whatnot, or in, even more specific condition control uh, signaling back to the rate adaptation part to the application. So we could also do that. All right, thank you. Right. Yeah, just one last comment. There, there is uh, for rate adaptation, and I don't know, uh, there are exam fairly small uh, examples of things like per frame QP, which is very responsive. That kind of assumes that you know what the target rate is. But anyway, uh, that, that is something we could play around with, um, as, assuming that we ever get uh, a bandwidth estimate that, that can be assumed to be provided by QUIC. We could do something like per, just get an idea of whether per frame QP would be useful. Yeah. Yeah. And we're close out of time here, so. Yeah, but not your part, not just, just trying to understand what's being proposed here. We have been trying to stay clear of hand-waving suggestions that may or may not work because it's hard to come up with very concrete wording that would be of any good use. So are you now suggesting that we should do again some, uh, try to come up with something or was this from both Mo and uh, Bernard more general suggestions? I'm, I'm, I'm trying like, to- transform More like experiments. I, I don't, yeah, I don't think it, any, hardly any of this needs to be in the document. It's okay, more just I, like, I'm good. Thank you. Just wanted, just wanted playing, to have playing with this stuff just because it's out there now and, and you could just do experiments. That's all. Okay, that, that, that's what we're doing anyway. Then I'm happy. Thank you. Good. Um, do you want to quickly go through the rest of the presentation? Is there, how much more presentation do you have? I think one more slide, which we like to, to discuss as Spencer's slide is the next one. And then we have one very or two very quick slides at the end. Okay, let's, let's, let's take a few minutes, but I think we're. This is an important topic. Right? Okay, so this one is Spencer. Do you want to present this? Sure. Uh, so basically, uh, since zero zero of the individual draft, uh, this draft has always included both streams and datagrams. Uh, I did ask on the mailing list and uh, if this was something that people actually uh, expect to use and uh, got response back from Bernard, you know, with, with a couple of examples of why that would be, uh, uh, you know, why both providing both makes sense. Uh, first question is, uh, would it be useful for us to provide guidance on choosing between uh, streams and datagrams? And uh, the second question is that uh, because we're doing uh, stop sending to allow a uh, allow an application to catch up on streams to basic you know basically uh, the receiver has decided that what it's getting is uh, old enough to where it wants to uh, catch up to the the front end you know the front end of the leading edge of what's coming uh, what's happening uh, that and that's that's fine uh, that's what's in the draft now but we noticed that uh, quick uh, rock center can resume uh, uh, resume something that was reset in streams using datagrams. Is that is that also okay? Uh, the straw man SDP would require a different SDP proto. proto uh, but my, the big question is, would anybody want or need to do this? And if, you know, if, if anybody wants or needs to do this, should we allow it? So those two questions about providing guidance between on choosing between streams and telegrams and about uh, resuming 
a, a rock receiver resu resuming RTP, uh, sending RTP that was on a stream using datagrams. Bernard? Yeah, I'll just give my opinion for what it's worth, which is that for a given media, you should choose one or the other. Like video, for example, will you do it with streams and then audio with datagrams, but you can't, it doesn't make sense to switch, like send, you know, video with streams and then switch over to datagrams that, that I don't know, that doesn't seem like something that makes a lot of sense to me, at least. Yeah, it, it doesn't make a, uh, and uh, I can't see the queue, my apologies, but uh, Mattis can. Uh, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And so the, I think the question for the draft is, do we need to say anything about that and uh, at the guidance level? Yeah, I mean, I, I could see where it could get really confusing. Like I send, I send a, a frame with a stream and then I start sending datagrams for pieces of it. Like, what would you do with that? I, I yeah. Know. And we could, I think we can make it work. The question is, would that ever be the right thing to do? Uh, so with datagrams, we really, actually, this is a good thing for us to write down too. Uh, with datagrams, my understanding is that we can't use anything like stop sending to catch up on streams uh, because datagrams don't have streams. But uh but uh, you know, so we, we can we can we can observe things like that. Uh, but uh, just like I said, what what need what guidance would be helpful to include in the spec, and what guidance would just be silly if we typed it? I guess the main thing was probably just prohibit weird types of mixing. And and similarly for RTCP, right? Why would you mix streams and datagrams? Like if you chose I want to send RTCP over datagrams, which seems most logical, just do that. Don't don't mix them up in weird ways. Uh, and uh, Bernard, thank you, thank you for that. Uh, for, thank you for that comment. Uh, I think what I think what you just said was that uh, that can be part of the guidance on choosing between streams and datagrams, which is uh, it would be you know don't plan on switching back and forth. <laughs> um, the, you know that if you if you choose one because it made sense, the other one is probably going to make less sense. Thank you for that. Well, uh, yeah, Mozanati, I don't know how relevant it is here, but in, in mock, uh, you know, we're kind of struggling with something similar about uh, should receivers be uh, able to request uh, their media in one format or the other, you know, over some particular stream structuring or, or datagrams. Uh, and I think we kind of gravitated to the fact that uh, we're going to let the senders uh, send however they want to send and not allow receivers to uh, to dictate a preference or negotiate a preference. And so maybe something like that can be useful here. That decision was more motivated uh, based on the fact that mock has fan out to many receivers, you know, almost by, by default in most use cases, whereas maybe you're thinking a lot more of one-to-one -one, uh, interactive scenarios here. But it does seem like the same kind of principle could apply that you let the sender, you can negotiate both up front and then you can let the sender decide whenever it thinks it needs to send a datagram or a stream, it should have the freedom to do so and not under any receiver um, restriction or preference. Uh, Mo, does it ever make sense to you to send both? Like send video yes. as a combination of datagram? Oh, okay. Yes. You think yeah, yes. for, for exactly your scenario, Bernard, you know, video over, over streams and audio over datagrams or even uh, core video over streams, but you know, uh, uh, disposable B-frames over datagrams also oh, okay. in addition to the audio. But that, that's, I think, easier to do as a, as a sender optimization rather than a negotiated um, you know, receiver preference or anything like that. Peter? Uh, Mo's comment made me think of one possibility where you would want to send with both streams and datagrams, which is if you FEC protected um, 
some video but not other video. So you may choose to use FEC above datagrams uh, to do the video on some, and then non-FEC video would use streams. It's just something that popped in my head, so possible scenario. I, I do agree with Mo in general that um, letting the sender do whatever it wants is better than making some constraints about what it can and can't do, because then your implementation on the sender is going to be more difficult, because you could do some things one time and other things another time. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, so yeah, then this one very quick. I mentioned the RTCP uh, analysis earlier, which we moved to later in the document. Uh, it would be really nice if some expert could review this too. We will review this again too, but it would be nice if people with more experience could look at it as well. Uh, next slide. And then we have uh, these five more open issues, which are which we didn't discuss today, but we are going to work on next. I think most of them are quite clear what's to do there. Um, and we are planning to have pull requests for them or merge pull requests for them for the next version until the next interim meeting. And I think that's it. Cool. All right. Great. OK, so I'll hopefully try to catch us up a little bit uh, talking about the HEVC profile for WebRTC. A um, little bit of an implementation update. We now have uh, uh, work underway in Chromium and Safari. There's tracking bugs for each of these. Um, and they're each making progress. Basically, uh, they're getting uh, STP negotiation is in. Uh, for the base profile and level, and the RTP payload format is in there. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the issues with RPSI implementation. Um, and the, uh, the HEVC encoder and decoder is already in Safari. Um, a couple of issues in, in Chromium and Edge with that, but hopefully that will, that will get working in the next couple of months. Um, and then bugs as usual. So anyway, progress being made, and hopefully at some point we'll have something working that people can play with. So in terms of issues and PRs, um, we now have a working group draft and uh, three issues I wanted to talk about and just get some working group uh, feedback on. Uh, TX mode, the, the packy stuff that we talked about last time, and then a little bit more about RPSI. Okay. So we talked uh, last at the interim about TX mode, and here is the proposed text. Um, and basically, I think we agreed that uh, the default would be to not include the parameter in STP and default to SRST. The only question is, um, what would you do with MRST and MRMT? We're saying it's optional to support this. And if you don't support it, don't include it in the STP. So presumably, I don't think any of the implementations in progress are planning on supporting MRST and MR MRMT. Um, so you'd never see that in an offer and presumably you shouldn't answer, answer back with that. Any objections to this proposed resolution? Okay. So then uh, next one was for the PACI packet. Um, it basically here, this is panel type 50. It's used to provide the temporal scalability control info, like the TID, stuff like that. And then the, uh, the thing is in Weber to see, we negotiate RTP header extensions that provide similar info, like the dependency descriptor or generic frame descriptor. So the question was what, what we do when we have both. And the proposed text here is basically to say that if you've negotiated the use of these RTP header extensions that provides CSCI, uh, don't send it in the in the PACI uh, extension. And then if you get it in the PACI extension, you just ignore it. Um, and if you don't if you don't negotiate the RGB header, then you would use PACI and obviously pay attention to it. But um, this is this is a proposal for the for handling the PACI. Any objections to that? Okay. So last one is RPSI. This one's a little bit interesting. We won't try to totally hash it out. But um, we discussed uh, previously that it is uh, recommended in RFC 8834 to support RPSI, defined in RFC 7798, Section 83, how to do it. Um, so the proposed text is to basically um, say that it's there and and um, uh, first of all, recognize in 778, 
98 that it's only used as a reference picture selection request, uh, not as positive acknowledgement. So say that, um, and then say it should be generated uh, if you uh, detect lack of synchronization. Um, these are basically suggestions that Stefan made. Uh, and the, the potential is that you send RPSI, but only get a, uh, uh, essentially a, a, a refresh back, an IDR. If so, you, you don't send RPSI because even though it negotiated it, it isn't really capable. Um, so this is the suggested text here. We did get a little bit of feedback that asked what it meant to say must act on the message uh, and should change the reference picture. That was a comment from uh, Philip Eliason of Google Stockholm. And he was wondering, um, you know, does it make sense to figure out whether the, the that the receipt that the sender doesn't support RPSI based on it sending an IDR instead of the RPSI. Um, I don't know if anybody has an opinion on that. Okay. Uh, not obviously uh, something people are passionate about. Um, the last thing, uh, and I don't want to get into this in too much detail, but uh, we have had some problems implementing RPSI. Um, and it has to do with the two usages defined in uh, 4585. One, you know, A is uh, indication of a requested reference picture. That's what 7798 does. The other is a positive feedback of a successfully decoded picture, um, which is not used in HVC. So the problem is that LiveWebRGC was assuming usage B. And um, essentially, the way it, it worked at one point was that it would forward the RPSI to the encoder um, and would generate the new P frame. And because it was a positive acknowledgement, the SFU could keep track of what uh, reference pictures people had. So it knew when it got back the, the P frame, who would be able to decode it or not. The problem is when you only use it as a requested reference picture, it's, it's a lot more difficult to figure that out. So anyway, um, live web is as it exists, at least currently without a bunch more work, um, the SFU won't be able to figure out whether it can actually, whether this new P frame can be decoded. So anyway, there's a whole bunch of discussion going on as to what to do to fix this or whether it requires, uh, you know, new, new feedback messages or whatever. But um, uh, I have heard actually, uh, Library to see isn't the only implementation that's actually had this problem with RPSI. So one question I wanted to ask is whether anybody's actually implemented RPSI with HEBC <laughs> successfully, um, or whether it's just us who can't figure this out. Okay, uh, no feedback. All right, um, I may bring this back and if we, if we do figure out how we wanna do it. Before we move on to the next presentation, did we skip V3C? I think we might have, you might have jumped over that, Bernard, when you were doing this slides. Oh, you did? Oh, okay. Um, we can go back to that. Uh, uh, I think it may be later. No, it was, it was, I think it was supposed to be earlier. Oh, okay. You said V3C? V3, oh, there this one. V3C. Okay. Before, all right. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah. So let's okay, we can set the timer for 10 minutes. And yep. is Lori here? Yep. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Perfect. Thanks for coming back for me. And hmm. um, yeah, this is another opportunity to save, time, save some time. Uh, let's go uh, jump right, right in. So the last call was issued and the uh, deadline was yesterday. Um, I saw four. Uh, votes in support and no support, no votes against. I don't know how the practice is from this on. Um, what happens next? Um, yeah, so if we've done working group last call, you said there's three open issues, we should uh, resolve those. They don't seem like any of them seem like they should be, those doesn't look like, at least as you list them here, that any of them should, should require a new, um, a new working group last call, they all seem pretty 
editorial. Um, oh yes, they, they definitely are. Yeah, and so we at that point we need to, I think, pick a uh, document shepherd and go to, so, you know, request uh, or submit it to the IUSG. So. Yeah, I'm still okay. I'm a shepherd for EVC and for Skip, so I'm kind of <laughs> yeah. both of the. So I I don't know if you have the shepherd. Oh. Well, I mean, so as as. Stefan mentioned at the last meeting that the shepherds don't have to be the chairs. So yeah, that's also true. If we can find another victim. <laughs> yeah, and Stefan volunteered to be the shepherd for something, so maybe we could ask him if he's willing to do that. Maybe this. we can ask him. Okay, great. We should put that yeah. in the notes. Yeah, or we'll find somebody. Yeah. What do you want the notes? Uh, we will pick a doc. We the chairs will discuss who we want to have document shepherd, and hopefully, will not be one of the chairs. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you. All right, very good, thank you. Saving us time. And uh, I guess now on to s -frame. Peter. All right, can you hear me okay? Yes. I'll just wait for the slide to show up. Did we have 10 minutes for this too? I think I'll have to, let me just not start your timer until we actually get to your slides. Yes, there we are. All right, there we are. All right, since the last meeting, the document has been adopted. And I submitted it with this just morning name change. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so next slide. Uh, next steps. I think the primary thing is to have more eyeballs on it. So please go read it. It's short. Um, so it shouldn't take long. I assume not many people have looked at it because I haven't gotten much feedback. Uh, I know after a quick look, Bernard fixed my ASCII art. So. I can make a new version with better ASCII art, but uh, I do think we need more eyeballs on it. Then my next question for everybody is, or I guess, should I pause and ask, who would like to read it? Or is that uh, Harold? Harold has you have a question? So just uh, Haralström, I read it and suddenly I got this horrible confusion in my mind. I mean, we put the purpose of S-Frame is so that you can do end-to-end -end encryption, which means it pass, the packets pass over multiple hops, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, the payload type that we have now put in the first byte of the, of the payload is negotiate a hop by hop. So does that mean that the relays are supposed to change the payload types when they relay the packets? Is that outside the end-to-end -end encryption? If so, I guess they have to. But... I mean, if, if they have to, that's important to call out in the, in the document because it means that you have relays modifying payload, which means that relays can only relay as frame if they understand this frame. I'm nervous. Uh, Magnus Westlund. Yeah, I think it's an unfortunate consequence for all that uses normal like off offer answer like negotiation where you, you you don't set it. You need to if you would have a negotiation style of setting all the configuration equal to all nodes, you wouldn't have to rewrite it, but for Current WebRTC, CP usage, etc. You would, I think, you you have no choice than to rewrite it, or or orchestrate your offer answer in such a way that, yeah, yeah. yeah. The effect is something that needs to be pointed out. That this is the a consequence of of the signaling system if you don't orchestrate it correctly. Uh, Mozanati, we, we had the same problem with PERC. <laughs> we introduced uh, uh, another payload type, uh, uh, the inner and outer payload type, uh, just just for that, <laughs> because we knew that we couldn't force them to be negotiated end to end. And so we had uh, the uh, inner uh, payload type and the outer payload type both in the same in the same packet. It has good feedback. I'll uh, make an issue on the GitHub. Okay. I would appreciate more such comments for more reading. Um, 
I'm glad that you only came up with one such uh, issue, Harold. I'm glad you read it. Thank you. Okay, so, well, can you go back? The next uh, question I had was um, about implementation. Is anyone interested in trying to implement it? Because I'm sure at that point we would find more issues that we could talk about. Or th does the working group feel like that is an important thing to do before I proceeding? Mean I certainly, I think having an implementation of this to make sure it works would be a good thing. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, the problem is there's kind of a chicken and egg doing anything in a browser because we don't have APIs to do this and we need to know how to do it to design the APIs. Harold? I'll just say that we're interested in, uh, as in, at Google, we're interested in implementing it, but we have no idea of the time frame in which we would be able to get to it. Well, it might be useful just to have a discussion among potential implementers, even if they don't mm. not ready to actually do it. Okay. Um, well, I had two other, if we had time, and it looks yeah, like we have four, four minutes. minutes. Uh, there were two questions that I put on previous slides that I thought warranted some discussion. Mm. Um, they're per not, perhaps not as uh, challenging as the one Harold brought up, but um, both basically have a size uh, simplicity trade-off. So the first one is whether the inner, uh, whether the header extensions get copied from the uh, inner codex value to the outer, so the broken up packet, um, for each of the broken up packets, or in which case it duplicates data, or not. Yeah, and I'm... Sorry, as an individual, Jonathan Lennox, um, I'm not getting in the queue because I'm Lazy. I think it's actually might even be more complicated than that, because like for dependency descriptor, um, you want to have the start and end flag set properly for the outer packets, even though the inner packet will have both start and end set because it's a single packet, you know, single large packet per frame. So this might be, you might actually need to be different. Hmm, that would be hard. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But yeah, but mostly for start and end flags for things, but lots of things have start and end flags. And you want those to be correct for the outer packets. Uh, Mozanati, you have a similar problem here again as payload types because the <laughs> header extensions are also negotiated uh, hop by hop in, yeah. in STP. And so you're going to have potentially different header extension IDs that have to get remapped um, to be meaningful to the, uh, uh, to the endpoint, to the NDN endpoints. Mm -hmm. Um, so whatever solution you pick for a payload type, you may have to mirror for the uh, for the header extension remappings. Well, those are slightly different because they're not within the encrypted portion. Okay. Uh, sauce. I just wanted to echo more like uh, the, the, the idea with Perk, I'm not saying that we should do anything like that or not, but the, the alternate payload header was inserted, uh, it was called inner 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 header was in, uh, inserted so that it can go end to end and, and that was used to kind of fill in uh, the things that we don't want to be negotiated or that would be be used in yeah. computing either nonce or anything for yeah, that. I, I, I mean, I think the, this isn't, the, the inner codec does, we don't have the header extensions in the encrypted context. It's just a matter of how do you transfer them from the virtual, from the conceptual, you know, uh, header, uh, conceptual packet to the actual on the wire packets. Because you don't, don't okay. so. Mm. Right. But I, I would like to ask, uh, Mo said something about how there was a solution for this in PERC, or not for the header extensions, but for the payload type. How was that done? 
with the, the the other payload type was that done with the header extension or Mosin, I'm sorry, it's been several years. I hope this is not too rusty, but I think we flip flopped back and forth several times between header extensions and payload uh, headers, and I think we I think we arrived on header extensions at the end. Uh, so there was a header extension for the OHB, I think, or something like that, mm. like that the, the outer mm. header block or something. Yeah, mm. and and it when it was a header extension that then defined. Uh, things that were different from the original packet uh, so that you knew that this packet originated with these other RTP fields, RTP header fields, uh, instead of what's in the current RTP header. Gotcha. Okay, well, I'll include that info in the GitHub issue that'll make. Looks like I'm out of time. Um, thanks for all the feedback. And just the other thing, um, the S frame Core document is in working group last call in the S frame group. So please, people, if you're interested in this, please review that to make sure it's right and does the right thing for what we're trying to do here. All right. Um, visual volumetric. Thank you, Mr. Shea. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you. So, um, so we published the new draft version of the viewport and uh, region of interest dependent delivery of visual volumetric media on 25th of September. Uh, we majorly addressed the comments received in the earlier uh, AVT core inter meeting. Um, so I'll go through the, uh, the updates in this current version. Uh, so the, main, uh, the syntax and semantics of the spatial region and the viewport basically are aligned with the MPEG specifications, MPEG uh, part five. Uh, the recorded representation of the uh, V3C data, and then also with uh, the MPEGI part 10 and MPEGI part 7, which is basically the MX, MPEGI, MPEG immersive media metadata specification. And then um, we added the definitions for the coordinate systems, keyboard, and the field of use, some of the nomenclature that we used. And then also we clarified in the draft that, in the draft that the origin point and the size of the spatial region are defined in terms of volumetric pixels, some of the comments that were received earlier. And also the 3D spatial region origin and size formats are defined. Uh, basically the anchor point is 32 bit signed integer and the size is the an unsigned integer and uh, all the four, th the four byte values, origin and sizes are basically expressed in the begin in format. And uh, <clears throat> the other changes were basically on the viewport uh, feedback control information, which is basically uh, updated to align with the MPEG I part five specification. So it now represents uh, presence of intrinsic and extrinsic uh, camera parameters information in the FCA messages based on some on the flags that were defined. And it also indicates whether the horizontal and the vertical field of view are same or different uh, and, other, other and other considerations. Um, and then we added the security considerations and the IANA considerations uh, to the draft. So we propose to add the attributes such as like a 3D regions and the SDP parameters and RDCP feedback type parameters such as static 3D regions, arbitrary spatial region and the 3D viewports and also some of the feedback messages uh, types for spatial region and the viewport. Uh, and also we define the RTC, RTP header extension. So the URIs are also defined for transmitted static 3D regions arbitrary spatial regions and the dynamic uh, spatial region. Uh, we also added some normative references and added some editorial, uh, editorial fixes in the draft. Um, yeah, so can you go to the next slide? So mostly we, uh, we addressed all the comments that we received in the earlier meetings. Um, any suggestions or feedbacks are always welcome for our draft and and we can use the ID mailing list for the suggestions. So that's what basically uh, as of now we are we are in that state. 
Um, and if we, yep. Yeah, no, I think, um, yeah, it sounds, so it sounds like this is ready for an adoption call. So uh, if, you, if you, I mean, if you think that it sounds like it is. Um, so I guess we can, uh, if, you, if you think that's ready, the chairs can take an action to do a adoption call. Sure. Yeah, that's what actually we feel like, because uh, if we don't have any further uh, suggestions and feedback, yes, I, we would uh, like to go for a working group adoption. So right now it is in the uh, uh, individual draft status. It can go to the AOT work draft status. Um, I will, yeah, so we'll do that call on the list, but I don't see anybody objecting here. So that sounds like it should be the next step. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Great. Thank you. So can we put those regular adoption calls? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So now haptics. Can we reset the timer for 10 minutes? I'm doing that. Hello. Uh, I'm Hinshik Yang. Um, today, I will present about RTP payload for haptics. Next slide. Ah. So, okay. So, I will explain briefly about the haptic. So, um, haptic can be defined as a technology that deliver haptic impact to the users through the kinds of tactile feedback generated by the electronic devices. So vibrotactile feedback and the force feedback are most common modality for haptic today. And in the haptic specification, it, it defined and risk 14 modality for haptic, but I think it will be it is expected to. It is expected that more will be implemented if, as um, te technical advance, and the haptic can be used between the human and the haptic interfaces, and or the virtual model for the communications, and um, hap or so haptic can be used along with audio and the video. And the, one of the one of the representative device is HMD head mount display, but the mobile phone or the game devices are also one of the example of the devices. Next slide. So this is a background of the haptic um, standard. We are participating in the development of the MPEG standard for haptics. So. Um, in the phase one, it defined the haptic data structures, data component, and some parameter for haptics. So it is going to move to the final draft international standard around January 2024, next year. And um, the ISO standard will be completed by um, end of the next year. So, and then the haptic phase two or uh, discussion of the haptic phase two or so having started with a new topic such as haptic inter interaction, avatars, XR, or, and the scene descriptions. Next, please. So, um, in the haptic specification, it defined MIHS. So MIHS unit are the unit of the streaming defined in MPEG haptic codec standard. So I think it's very similar to the now unit in the video, but uh, so, and the function is almost same, but um, in the haptic, it defined the new name for the haptic streaming format. So it has four type of MIHS unit. Uh, one is the initialization unit, and it includes the timing information and the metadata. So it can be used to set up the timing or change the timing. The next one is temporal unit. A temporal unit include haptic impact that vary over time. Um, spatial unit also include haptic impact, which do not vary continuously. 
And the last one is slide, uh, silent unit. It can be used to notify the haptic silence period. So it, MIH ha has a four type and the MIH has comprised MIH unit header and the multiple MIH packet. Next slide. So for the haptic, we define the um, three parameter and then with that, we define the structure for the archipelago header. So first one is dependency that we call the D. D they indicate whether the packet contained in the RT payload is a sync packet or not. And the unit type is indicate the type of the packet contained in the RT payload. And it also represent um, transmission methods such as aggregation or fragmentations. And the L means MIS layer. So MIH unit layer set by the sender based on application specific need. So based on that, sender or receiver can decide which packet uh, should be managed more prioritized. Uh, next slide. So this is the example of the SA parameter. I think the most of the thing is same, but uh, we define the new soft type HMPG. Is, it is defined by the um, haptic specification. And then uh, other thing is almost same as the, um, the general STP parameter. Next slide. I actually had one comment. Um, Jonathan Lennox says an individual. I believe that this will also require registering the M equals haptics yeah. for the S for the STP registry as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. The next slide, please. Yeah. So I this is a the, this draft is the first step to describe the RT payload format for haptic coding standard, and um, our reference software implementation is available for the encoder and the decoders, and we developed in a in house implementation of the RT payload format for future interrupt testings. And so I think we are looking for people interested in the reviewing, implementing, or the participant in the draft. And, and then, like I mentioned before, the MPEG haptic coding standard is nearly complete, completed. So we need to follow it and then adapt the draft if need be. Um, and then the to solve the the problem to access the uh, standard uh, MPEG standard documents, so we can ask the the MPEG to make some information available to the ITF members through the region statements. Any questions? Sure. Yeah, your <clears throat> your code maybe question and a comment. Um, first of all, I think, I think this is interesting. Um, it's nice to see, to, to see that actually here. I'm curious, is, there's often many, many fora working on similar things and gaming and the like have been around. So is MPEG the only entity that has been looking in the, into these kind of content format specifications? Um, I think so, because the rest is proprietary then by whatever Sony or PlayStation and or whoever. Yeah, you know, you know, always the commercial, commercial industry and the standard cannot go to the same way, but like like the IoT. So maybe um, I hope we, I hope that MPEG specification will be a, a good standard for the industry too. Okay, thanks. Then, then just one comment. You had the synchronization bit in your header. Have you considered the fact of that you might be using the marker bit contained in the RTP header, which is usually a bit uh, left out of uh, mm -hmm. practical usage yeah. um, in, in, in many formats? I'm just curious whether that could help you save some bits somewhere, but this is more a comment to think about rather than requiring any instant response. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Stefan? So to answer Jörg's question, I'm aware of at least one effort that's going on in IEEE. It's at a somewhat different, uh, it, 
of standardizing haptics. It's at a somewhat different level uh, uh, in the technology stack though than, than this MPEG thing. Um, I believe there's also some uh, quasi open spec by Apple uh, that it does a subset, I think, of what, what uh, the MPEG guys are doing with the different syntax. So it's, it's, it's not only MPEG which is doing that, but then again, the MPEG standards have some, have some uh, history of, of taking, taking over uh, certain technology fields and uh, I'm, I'm personally following this a little bit and have, have colleagues who are following very closely and, and they say it's, it's, it's probably the best uh, uh, technology that's currently out in development in this particular field. Thank you. Thank you. Harold? Harold Alistair, as uh, in the discussions in the uh, Media Man, the working group for registration of the haptics top level type, we have had at least four different efforts of defining haptics type. The current draft only references ISO because that's the believed to be the most stable reference. Uh, but uh, we expect a number of vendor types to be registered once the registry is ready. Yeah, okay, I'll kind of yeah. check it. But I mean, I think just as we have no problem having any number of video codecs, we would have, have no problem having any number of haptics codecs that people want to define those. So, but um, I see. Okay, thank you. Okay, so yeah, so do you think this is something that we would be ready for adoption or do we want to, do you want to develop it further first? Um, actually, we got some response in, in the email list. Email list so oh. we will update soon before the next meeting or the interim meeting, and then we will share it. OK, so, great. Thank you. thank you. Stefan, did you have something more to say? You know, uh, this this thing is pretty darn good already. So I, I would, um, I don't think the two authors have a lot of uh, experience on how the ITF works uh, in so far. Um, I, I would almost suggest uh, let them update it and then make an adoption call. Yeah. OK. We sure. are, we are, we are not operating here in meeting cycles uh, like the MPEG people do. So, and and that's maybe a misunderstanding on their side. So, okay. so move that thing forward. It's good. Thank you. Sounds, sounds good. Thank you. All right. And geometry, let me reset the timer. All right. All right. So this is a very early draft on RTP payload format for geometry-based point load compression. Uh, next slide, please. Or this is something we worked together with uh, Jörg and Lukas. Uh, first, a little bit background on point clouds. So point clouds are data structures uh, used to represent three-dimensional data. Um, they are basically a list of uh, points in three-dimensional space, and where each point in this list can be associated with uh, attributes such as color or reflectance or something else, whatever you want to represent or associate associate with these points. Um, point clouds can be um, acquired by LiDAR devices or radar or multiple camera setups and can, for example, be used for representation of uh, surroundings of a vehicle or um, to make scans of objects for archival purposes or something like that. Um, next slide, please. So background on this codec. Uh, earlier we have talked about V3C, I think, and um, this is a little bit different because we we 3C uh, uses a little bit different technology to um, encode three-dimensional data. And um, I think V3C is targeted as at more dense uh, geometries, whereas GPCC is targeted as more at more uh, sparse point clouds, uh, such as generated by LiDAR devices, for example, in vehicles. Um, the codec itself uh, encodes geometry data and attributes data as two separate um, parts. Uh, the geometry data is encoded first and the attributes is um, then afterwards and the decoding of attributes uh, depends on the decoding of geometry data. Uh, the bitstream of the codec um, is or uses different types of data units. This could be parameter sets, uh, general parameter sets and parameter sets for geometry and attribute data separately. Um, and then it has 
different types of data units for geometry data and attribute data, which um, we map to the payload format later independently. And then there's an XB in the um, codec description that describes some type length value bitstream format, where it basically just has a type of the data unit and the length of the following data unit and then the value. Um, we defined a very simple payload format. Uh, next slide, please. For this building on this type length value uh, and coding, but uh, only or kind of adapted it to to the payload format. Uh, we used the very standard RTP header usage with the timestamp defined as the earliest sampling time of the point cloud frame. Uh, there could be different sampling times for different points in one frame, but since the GPCC. Um, specification uses the notion of point cloud frames. We also use this notion and say the earliest one of that is used as the um, timestamp. And for now we settled, uh, we say in the document that we must use the 90 kilohertz uh, frame rate for, for that, a um, frequency for the timestamp. Um, the payload header uh, is then only one byte following the RTP header. And the payload header basically consists of two fields. One is the, um, or the first one is the field describing whether this one is a single unit, an aggregation unit, or part of a fragmentation unit. And then for fragmentation units, whether it's the start or the end of it, or the middle part. And then the second type field in the um, payload header is uh, the unit type of the data unit that's contained in that RTP packet. And then since we don't need the length field from the type length value encoding for single and um, fragmentation units, we included the length field only for the aggregation unit following the one byte payload header um, to indicate the length of each um, following uh, data unit in that packet. And then we have for the next one, the following data unit in the same aggregation unit, again, payload header with the one byte and um, next field. Uh, all right, next slide, please. Uh, we defined some sim simple signaling for the first version, which uh, includes a profile and level ID for the codec. And then we defined some um, parameters for signaling things like the resolution uh, of the point cloud frame uh, the, or the point clouds to be transmitted, the coverage of the um, field, like the which part of the environment is covered. For example, this could be defined as the field of view uh, of a sensor. Um, and we have an anchor point defined in the signaling that describes uh, like one anchor point and one uh, stream of point clouds that could be used to relate multiple point clouds together. Um, then we have an orientation and position of the sensor and uh, then we can also signal the attributes that are associated with single points in the point cloud or in the stream of point cloud frames. Uh, yeah, I think that's all for today. Magnus. So our, so none of these are gonna be time sensitive. That it will, that would I, time dynamic, I would say. It will change over time. Like the so the uh, uh, current what you're saying is you're creating an RTP payload format for something where the view of a set of cl uh, point clouds the point clouds position in space is not changing over time. Uh, yes, for this one we were also thinking about uh, how to signal this in like if it changes over time. Like we can't do this in SDP, I guess, but um, maybe something like header extensions or RTCP feedback to request some some of these from the receiver side could be thought of in the future, I think, but that's not in the draft yet. Okay. Shrivas? Yeah, just to add on that, actually, yeah, the, the, the frames oh, oh, do change over time. So we, we can, can either have single frame of data per point load, or it can be changing over time as well. The GPCC supports both of them. And we also have like a part 18, the specification that talks about the carriage of geometry data, which supports both timed and non-timed data of the GPCC frames, coded GPCC frames. Thank you. Jonathan, I, so this is the markers of video, correct? I mean, 
What is the top level? What is the mind factory using for this? Uh, I think the draft currently has application. Okay, um, application. All right. So we dis we discussed. Sorry. <laughs> so we we discussed this in our group. Um, we were thinking about video or application. We settled for application for now. If there are good arguments for something else, then I think uh, we can talk about that. Of course. Did you want to say Magnus? Or I uh, guess... You have others in queue. Okay, yeah, sorry. Uh, are you still in queue or did you not unqueue yourself? If not, Spencer? Sorry. Uh, th thank, thank you. Uh, this, this was just my uh, opportunity to, to ask people to take a look at uh, what you've said and make sure that it, it was captured correctly in the notes. Uh, I've been I've been uh, helping with the notes, but uh, and uh, yeah, but I mean, like multiple people were taking things and they're still taking notes and there are still some questions. Uh, so that's just for the group for the uh, entire session. Thank you. Great. Okay. So, uh, Magnus, just done. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to the media type, that's an interesting, but I guess there are also similarities is like uh, motion JPEG and things like that. It's time sequence snapshots uh, of, of the point cloud. So I guess video could work, but yeah, application, I guess, is... is so. Do we have any application slash RTP formats already? I don't think... I mean, there's nothing... Stories we had the proposals in that space, but I mean, I guess the game events was in there. Yeah. I think the earlier, some of the... Uh, yeah. For other binary object like things were, but yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, I think that's the same thing. But it, it sounds like you have to think about how you're going to do this dynamic update if you actually uh, rather treat this video with and get the encoding inside the payload format for each frame in, in when they are updated, etc., when the boundaries of it and coverage. Yep, true. Uh, thanks. So, um, all right, is that, did you, what, what do you see, think of as the status of this? Do you, does it need more work or is this? Uh, it's an early draft. I think it definitely needs more work. Okay. Um, so um, keep working on it. This is that just FYI. Okay, great, cool. Awesome. All right, thanks. All right, thank you. And was that, I think that might've been everything. Yes. All right, do we have any other business people want to mention? Yeah, I just thought we could um, just clarify what next steps we need to do based on all of the drafts we just went through. Mm -hmm. That's a good plan. Um, do you want to, let's see, how do I get to the note taking tool now? Let's see. So I think one thing was to summarize the working group last call for the B3C, mm -hmm. which just finished like two hours ago, so I will do that. Great. Action item to do that. Um, I think we have a, one or two calls for adoption we're supposed to do now. I think so, yeah, certainly on, uh, okay, yeah, so the, the, it looks like the authors are gonna do a revision of haptics, and then we could probably do a call for adoption on that. And we'll do a, uh, ready for call for adoption on visual volumetric. So yes, and then let's see, all, some of the other dra drafts authors have actions to take. Um, Bernard, you're gonna work with them on skip. Right. Um, and I think, was that? I mean, we're, we're just repeating what's already in the notes. So, but um, yeah, v V3C, um, Bernard is going to go over, uh, basically, you know, basically summarize the WGLC, um, and you know, sounds like it's just editorial changes that need to be made, and okay, yeah, I think that's I think that's everything. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And we'll...
given we seem to have been having success having interims in this group, so we'll probably have one sometime before the next meeting. Bernard and I will talk about that. Um, yep. I guess probably after the holidays, January, I should suspect. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We will talk about that and talk about it almost. Thank you all. This was super helpful as usual. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it's amazing we got through all of it on time. <laughs> <laughs>